Good evening. It's good to be with you again on this Wednesday night. I'm very, very happy to be here and thank you for your decision to join us this evening for our Wednesday night Bible study get together. So glad that we're able to do this. So tonight, um, first of all, I want to thank you for your attention last week. I went a little over time. Uh, at least longer than I had intended. So I appreciate your attention and I pray that you were able to be blessed by the things that we covered. And tonight I'm excited to continue on um, in this same chapter of Romans chapter 8, but for sure we'll take a whole different look at one of the scriptures we covered last week that has just jumped out and been something that I've meditated and studied upon for the last week. So with that in mind, um, I turn your attention back to the book of Romans chapter 8. And for our discussion tonight, I want to focus on verses 15, 16, and 17. So I will read them and then we'll begin to look into these verses, unpack them, and see what it is that we can learn about the things of God tonight. Romans chapter 8, starting verse 15, this is the King James Version. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And those are the verses I want to focus on tonight. And I primarily want to focus on the phrase or the term, the spirit of adoption. I want to talk to you tonight about what the Bible has to say about adoption, what it is, what it means. And certainly when I use that word, many of you um, will say, well, we know what adoption is. And I I know that we, we do, especially in our society, it's a very honorable thing when parents adopt children and give them a home and make them part of the family. And that's really how we understand adoption. And that is a good thing. And so with that in mind, let's look at what Paul means when he talks about adoption. To begin that conversation, I want to read Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, just as I previously did in the New International Version. And you'll hear the difference, and I think it will start our minds thinking in the right way as we go into this subject. Romans 8 and 15, starting in in the New International Version, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So these are the same three verses that um, we read in the King James Version, where the King James says, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption. The New International says that we did not receive the spirit to make us slaves, but we received the spirit that brought about our adoption to sonship. And so that's that's where we want to begin tonight. The subject of sonship is a very large and big subject. It's, it's, it's always been something that 
uh, has been a blessing to me. You see, we can have a relationship with people who are our friends. We can have a relationship with people that are our family. We have a different relationship with employers. But this relationship of sonship is a very endearing and close, connected relationship. And it's a positional uh, a relation, uh, a positional uh, place, a relationship that is very close to the Father. Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and He was at was um, the most intimate, closest, connected relationship that you could be. To become a son of God would be a high, uh, a high honor. And of course, we we become sons of God first of all by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is what Paul's talking about mostly in Romans chapter eight. Uh, there's a verse in Saint John that says, "To them, uh, to them that believe, gave he power to become the sons of God." So this is a great calling that God would call us to be His sons, but it also comes about through the process of adoption. Jesus Christ was God incarnate, and he was born through a virgin birth as she was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that can truly say he was begotten of the Father, and therefore a true and singular son of God. But we who have been born again are sons of God, but we are sons of God by adoption, and that's what we want to look at tonight. Now, in Romans chapter 8 and 15, he talks about the spirit of adoption. And it's interesting, he said, by him we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba there can be translated or transliterated as Daddy. It's a very affectionate, childish kind of name, but it implies complete trust and affection. And that's what he has given us towards God, this holy invisible, unseen, all-powerful, eternal God, we can have a relationship with him as sonship, even one that through the Holy Ghost, we're able to call him daddy. But there's four other places in the New Testament that Paul uh, refers to adoption. And they, they are all found, well, there's five of them. And the New International Version in each place translates that as uh, adoption to sonship. So let me refer to them. Uh, The 15th we've already read, Romans 8 and 23 says, "Not not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Romans 9 and 14, Paul referring to the people of Israel says, the people of Israel, theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs, the divine glory, the covenant, the receiving of the law, temple worship, and promises. I read the next two verses as well, because I want to have these as an underlying uh, reference point. Galatians 4 and 5, he writes to the believers there and says, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption to sonship. And then the last verse is found in Ephesians 1 and 5, where Paul says, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. So what I want to say to you tonight is that Paul had an understanding of adoption in his time. And this was not something that he just brings up in Romans. This is something that he touches on, uh, refers to, uh, to three different churches or three different uh, congregations, people who are going to read these letters, the Romans, the Galatians, and also in Ephesians. And obviously, he is talking about something that he is well knowledgeable of. So to begin, let's establish the fact that there was no process for adoption in the Jewish culture. You won't find it referred to or practiced in the Old Testament. Uh, 
when a man would die, his brother would take over his estate, was even required to bear children with his uh, widowed wife, and everything then would pass on to the deceased uh, person's estate, and that name would not be removed out of Israel. Uh, so there was really no reason for adoption because when there was a death, a family member would take over and incorporate them into the family and make sure that they were taken care of. Adoption in our society is primarily done so that someone who does not have parents or has parents that are not available to them can take them into their home, provide for them, love them, and give them a family. And it is a very um, generous and charitable thing to do. But this is not all that Paul had in mind. Paul was a Pharisee and a Jew, yes, but he had Roman citizenship and he was very well versed in the Roman world and how to move in and out of it. And so by reading these verses, we understand that he, it is the Roman culture or idea of adoption that he is referring to. In the Roman culture, a child that was, uh, was biologically yours um, the parent had the option whether they would disown them or, or keep them permanently. If they were an undesirable child, the parent could and at times would disown them and move away, move past them and let that child make it on their own. It was just the way their society was. But in the first century Roman world, and in the world that Paul was uh, aware of, an adopted son was someone who was chosen deliberately by his father to perpetuate his name and inherit his estate, and he was not inferior to any biological son that they may have. See, adoption in Rome was done to establish inheritance, not to provide a home or a family. Many fact, matter of fact, um, so not to bore you, let me just say in passing that many of the Caesars, Augustus Caesar, who was Caesar when Jesus was born, was adopted and would not have become a Caesar if he had not been adopted. Now he was adopted by a family member, but he was not an orphan that somebody just brought in and said, I'm going to give them a home. He was intentionally selected by um, his great uncle and the kingdom was passed down to him. Eventually he became the sole ruler of it, but he was adopted. You may have heard of the famous uh, Caesar by the name of Nero, who was so um, cruel to Christians after the day of the church. He was adopted. In other words, the Caesar at that time selected him and made him one of his own. So this puts adoption in a whole different light. So when a child was adopted in the Roman times, his life and standing was completely changed. He, he lost all rights in his old family. He gained all the new rights of his new family, which would have been important because many times this meant he was going from a rich family to a richer family. Um, and now everything new was his. his. His old life was completely wiped out. Anything that he had done wrong, anything he had done right, it was a completely fresh start. All of the debts, anything that this child had, a lot of times they were grown men. They were they weren't counted against him uh, anymore. So he was a child that was chosen and desired by the parents. He would become a permanent part of the family and could not be disowned as a biological son could be. He's given a new identity, a new family culture, a new name, uh, and everything in the old was passed away. And this is exactly what Paul is referring to when he says in, in Romans chapter 8, we've received not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption. Because Jesus Christ, 
through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, has chosen us. We are adopted sons of God. We have a new identity. Our connection to our old family, that is the Adam family, is gone. All of our past is covered up. We start fresh. We start new. And now we have something very uh, meaningful. Matter of fact, we become an heir of God. This is, this is just remarkable to me. In verse 17, he said, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God. How many people, you know, we joke about the fact of, oh, maybe I've got a rich uncle somewhere that'll leave me something. But, you know, to those of us who've been born again, we've got far more than that. We're not an heir of Donald Trump. We're not an heir of Elon Musk. We're not an heir of the Rockefellers or any of these people, the Gates or the, the Buffets. Um, we're an heir of God. Can you just imagine all of the treasures and the wealth and the greatness that God is, and we're heirs of that. And then he says, we're joint heirs with Christ because everything God has belongs to Jesus, is bequeathed to him because he is the only spotless lamb, the sinless man, the perfect man. Certainly inherited all of these things. And one of the things Hebrews tells us he inherited that was so great was a greater name. So, this adoption is something not to be taken lightly. It is something that means spiritually that we have great privileges. We are called sons of God. And therefore, this is a great covenant relationship that, that we have. So with that in mind, I want to touch on a few other things in the few moments we have remaining. In Hebrews chapter 3, 2, and 6, the writer there talks about Moses and Jesus. Now, in the Jewish mind, there was none greater than Moses. You'll see that in the discussions they had when they wanted to argue with Jesus. They'd say, Moses said this, or Moses said that, or, you know, Abraham was great, yes, but Moses was, was the man. And the writer of Hebrews is comparing the Old Testament worship with what Christ has brought in, and he keeps consistently making the point that this is a better way. Jesus is a better way. He's a better way. He's a better way. And if you were a Jew, your mindset would have been, oh, but Moses is great. How can somebody be that great? Moses was the greatest. But in the third chapter of Hebrews, he said, speaking of Moses, said, who was faithful to him that appointed him? Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So he's comparing Jesus to Moses. He said both men were faithful, just like Moses was faithful in his house. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, is when God told Moses how to build the tabernacle, Moses built it exactly like God said, and he was considered faithful. He was faithful in everything God instructed him to do. And the writer is saying, Jesus is that faithful as well. But he says in verse 3 that this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. So although Moses had built the house of God at God's instructions and commands, he was not, he was, he, he, he built the house, he was connected to the house, but he did not design the house. That was God. And the writer here of Hebrews is saying, Jesus was the one that designed that house. So therefore he's greater than Moses. He said, for every house is built by some man. Yes, that house and the tabernacle was built by Moses, but he that built all things is God. So this is just wonderful how he is unfolding this. And notice what he says in verse five, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Let's just catch that word right there. He was not faithful in his house as a son. He was faithful as a servant. Is that a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing, but it's not the greatest thing. He was faithful as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken after. So Moses, everything Moses did and accomplished and was, 
was to point to something that was yet future, something that was greater, something that was beyond him. And that's where the Jewish mind got focused. They just, they locked in on Moses and they thought, well, we've arrived. No, you haven't arrived. He's just a major stepping stone to that which is to come. But notice what he summarizes in verse six. But Christ as a son over his own house, that is a different house than what Moses had. That's whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Here's what I want to just throw out there and have you think about for a while. Anytime we talk about Moses or the law, we're talking about what you have to do to be righteous. And when you are required to do something, you are by definition a servant. You are a servant. And when we look at the law of Moses and the commandments, it says thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that. We're required to do those things if we're to obtain righteousness. It was a relationship with God based upon our doing and our actions or a lack of relationship based upon our omission or neglect of those things. So in that way, even if you served God in the Old Testament, like the rich young ruler who said, I've kept all the commandments, even if you could do that, which I'm not so sure I believe that the young man did, but when we get to heaven, we can ask the Lord about that. But even under the law, if we were perfect and could keep the law, the best we could be would be a servant. But Christ, who was faithful like Moses, he's over his own house, who the writer says, whose house are we if we hold fast this confidence? And the people that belong to Christ's house are not servants, but they are sons. I move to John 8 and 33. And let me read this situation for you. They're having a conversation with Jesus and he's telling them that they're not acting like Abraham, their father, because of the way they're treating him. And he said to them that they were, you know, that they were in bondage and they were highly offended at this because even though the Romans ruled over them, they were so uppity and proud that they're like, no, nobody rules over us. Well, your pride has blinded you. Yes, somebody has ruled over you and they would get offended by that. But here's what Jesus said. They answered him, we are Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? I can just, I, I'm sorry, I had to put the sarcasm in there. I can just imagine their tone when they re responded to Jesus. And he said, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So there again, they were looking at the natural, the literal. He's saying, you're in bondage because you're a servant to sin. Whatever sin tells you to do, you do. But they couldn't see that. They didn't understand that. So therefore they were offended. But notice what Jesus says here. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. In other words, you may be in the house, but you're just a servant. If you're serving sin, then you're just a servant. But if you're free from sin, which means you're a child of God, he said, the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In other words, it doesn't matter how high up position you have in any kind of religious hierarchy or system where you think that you're pleasing God based upon your own works. At its best, you're still a servant. But the servant does not abide forever. In other words, you can't continue to live for God on a performance-based relationship because you'll blow it every time. You'll fall every time, and therefore you can never make it. But when we become a son, how do we become a son? We become a son by placing our faith, our trust in Christ, repenting of our sins, taking upon his name in baptism, receiving his spirit, and the son, he said, is what makes us free. So I hope I can take some of these puzzle pieces now and put them together. I'm going to close by going right back to Romans chapter 8.
And I want you to look at this verse with me for just one more time. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now, why would he even feel obligated to say that? Well, it's not an obligation. It is in the context of these scriptures, he's talking about sin and the condemnation that sin brings. He's talking about the law, about the law of sin and death. So he says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, you haven't come out of a religious experience where you had to fear the wrath of God all the time if you broke a commandment and you were always on edge and you're always fearful. He said, you've not come from the law into Christ and you're not going to experience that same kind of intimidation or fear you had under the law. Because when you live under a law, when you try to please God by your works, there's always this fear, this dread. Oh, what if I mess up? What if I'm this? What if I'm that? And yes, I am spiritually attuned and I too am concerned. Am I doing all that I can do for God? But my relationship with him is one where he is my master, my Lord. I highly reverence him and respect him. But that's all combined also with the same spirit of adoption that says, thank you, daddy. You're my, you're my Lord, your father. Yes, but you're more than that. You're daddy. And it's a relationship that doesn't work at that level of fear. So this is why Paul says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The new, te- the new international version flat out says, you didn't receive something to make you a slave. This Holy Ghost experience is not to uh, make you a slave. You're not in bondage. Do I feel a desire to do things for him? Yes, abundantly. And that desire should be even more than I felt that the law even required. But it's one of willingness, not of obligation. And so he said, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So he's given us a new identity. He's given us a whole new way of looking at him, walking with him, relating with him. And it's all because we have been adopted as sons of God. Well, I feel like that is a good place to stop here tonight. I'm not so sure that I've adequately covered everything. Certainly as a teacher, you always uh, sometimes feel like, well, I wonder if I could have said this or that. It would give more clarity to the subject. But I'm going to leave it at that tonight. I pray that the Spirit of God has enlightened you, caused your mind to think and to connect things in the Scripture that will be a blessing to you. Most of all, help us to be more like Jesus and more grateful for the work of grace and the power of his spirit that's a work in our lives. So thank you for being with me tonight, for enjoying the word of the Lord with me. Thank you for the gift of your time. I pray that you are blessed and that we were all edified together. Until the time that we see you this Sunday, may God bless you, cause his face to shine upon you. God bless you in Jesus' name.